So this night, uh, I fell asleep and I woke up at 10 o'clock and the knock at the door is a police officer. And coming out of my sleep, I was thinking TJ had gotten a ticket or something. Or something like that. But what he said to me, he said, uh, he asked me for my license. And so I went and got my license. And uh, he said, so you're TJ's father. Timothy, he said, Timothy Hawkins Jr.'s father. I said, so yes, and, and now I'm starting to worry. And he told me that my son. We want to welcome you to Story Sessions from your friends at Love Shaped Life. This podcast is dedicated to sharing the story of people's lives. The Bible is a uniform story uh, speaking to every human heart that God is love. And all of us have a special place in that heart. Today, uh, our special guest is Tim Hawkins. He's here here to share uh, how God has impacted his life and share his story. Tim, we want to welcome you. I want to thank you for having me. It's a pleasure being here. It's great to have you with us. Tim, as we start off, we also like to ask, just share with us briefly about your background, where you came from, what life was like for you growing up, and what impacted your life the most. So I was born in Baltimore, Maryland. I, I said, uh, I felt the, the, the Maryland accent come in saying Baltimore, so I, That's I corrected okay. it. It's so, all good. So I'm from Baltimore, Maryland. And... Uh, I was raised in uh, East Baltimore, and then um, after, from the, I was there from the seventh to the ninth grade, and after the ninth grade, we moved to West Baltimore, and uh, when we moved to West Baltimore, it was, um, it was a, a, a culture, a culture shift. It was a shock in my life. Well, I want to stop you there for a moment, if I mm-hmm. might. You said you went from east side to west side, right? Mm-hmm. So share with us, what was east side like? So when we, when me and my mom, it was just me and my mom, when we lived in East Baltimore, my days were, were filled with, um, I had friends of uh, multi, different different races. Um, everything was, was uh, calm. I had no worries. And we played sports all day. And basically until it was dark when I had to come in and, you know, I, I never had any, any issues with, with anything. So you were having what was called a, a, a nice childhood, right? On yes. the east side, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, the thought of being able to stay out to the sun's going down, just playing with your friends is just a, an exciting thought. It's hard to even imagine that, un- unfortunately, in our society today. Yeah. Usually you have to have a parent with you or something. So share with us, what was the west side like then? So the west side in... In the time that I moved there, which was 1983, it was an open air drug market, and and by open air drug market, I mean drugs were being sold everywhere you could see. It was uh, addicts uh, of all types. It, it was violence. You would see, uh, you would hear gunshots. The police were a heavy presence. Helicopters and. All kinds of uh, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. That's basically what it was. I believe you shared with me that the the east side was more of a multicultural uh, setting for you growing up. And then the west side was? The west side was all black. And Mm -hmm. at that time in West Baltimore, specifically um, Edmondson Avenue, and that's a pretty popular street for if anyone knows, uh, is familiar with Baltimore. Um, It was all black. and, And for the most part, uh, when I saw um, someone of a different race come into the neighborhood, it was to buy drugs or mm-hmm. they were a cop. So that must have been a huge, like you mentioned, a culture shock for you. What impact did that have on you as a child, going from like that east side environment to this now, this environment in the West? So the, the thing that stands out the most to me when I came, when, when I first, when we first moved into the house and I, and I saw the neighborhood, I felt like um, I was alone. And so I, I had a brother, but my brother is uh, 10 years between me and my brother. And, but um, I felt alone, I didn't understand, and the people, that, the, the people my age that I was around, 
in high school, they looked at me like I was an alien because uh, in, at that time, everything was uh, hip hop clothing. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm like uh, in the 10th grade and I'm still dressing like I'm playing sports because that's the only thing that mattered to me. And so, so now I'm looked at at this alien. And so summing it up for, for that whole year, I, I didn't play with anybody. I didn't have any friends mm. in on a West in West Baltimore. And so what I would do is I would go to school, and when I when I got out of school, I would jump on the bus and go to the other side of town, and which was the east side. And I played with all of my friends. Mm. And uh, one of the, the the good memories that I have is that um, when the bus would approach the east side, all of my friends, people on the bus would look at me because it'd be like. 15 kids and it'd be like uh di different kids different nationalities they're all standing on the bus stop and when i got off the bus they'd be like tim tim we and oh, that's uh, beautiful. it it yeah. was it was just amazing and and from that get from getting off of the bus stop i i would leave there the, the last bus left east baltimore about 10 10 o'clock mm -hmm. and i would uh mm -hmm. That we run back to the bus stop, and it got to a point where the bus drivers would would recognize the kids there, and they would hold the bus for me longer, so I could. Wow. This was a public bus, so I could get on there. And um, the people coming from, because that side of town was where is um, uh, O'Donnell Heights, Bruning Highway. It was a big shipping plant, and so you had people leaving that shift, and the people on that bus would recognize the kids and. It would just wave because it was such a normal thing. Wow, wow, mm -hmm. that's that's so interesting. How you have this one city and you got these two separate sides, right? Mm -hmm. Well, east side and west side. There was more sides, but how different they were. Mm -hmm. You shared with me as we spoke uh, earlier that your mom had this encounter with God as you were growing up, and mm -hmm. and that even impacted her life and and how she dealt with the community and and what you got to see. Tell me, uh, tell us about that. Okay, so, um, so just putting the time specific, um, I had an ex I had an experience with um, with some mi missionaries. They knocked on the door, and they asked me if I accepted Christ into my heart. Now, and this was I was in the eighth grade, and I said yes. And my mom and my godmother they were in the living room, and when I told them, they laughed. And you know, I didn't go to church after that or anything but now get getting to when we were on the wet on the west side my mom ended up accepting christ and and when she accepted christ what i the change that I, that i saw in her was she now it became an advocate for an advocate a uh, safe house for addicts for cleaning the community up and um, she instituted a, a a whole bunch of programs that um that helped change uh, her neighborhood. And one was the, the Midtown Edmondson Association. And, and the motto for, that, for, for the Midtown Associ Edmondson Association was, it's not where you live, it's how you live. Mm -hmm. And nice. so one of the lessons that, that me and my brother had, to this day, uh, anybody that knows me, if you see me at a restaurant or something, I have paper or something twirling in my hand and um, I don't litter because my mom would just go ballistic if I threw paper on the ground. So to this day, I don't litter. <laughs> no, that's a good thing, right? <laughs> it is. That's it a is. good thing. But for her to to instill that in me in this open air market, it, it's just amazing. Yeah, and, it is amazing. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. and she and, ended up and, having a street named after her in Baltimore. Wow. And that's wow. how. That's the to the, the extent that she had um, just affected her neighborhood mm. so to this day there's still a street in baltimore named after your mom yeah yep, wow yep, that's beautiful yep. and that's that because of the impact that she had yep for people and that uh midtown edmondson association there is a uh there was a a player there was an nfl player that um eventually he was on the news because he in that neighborhood he was um uh, donating money and and like it was it was normal in that in that area at that time where the schools didn't have uh, air conditioning the schools didn't have a gym and this was her uh, association that he ended up um, uh, 
continuing. You know? mm. yeah. Wow, that's yeah. beautiful. Mm. And uh, praise God for the impact uh, on your mom's life and, and how she turned around and impacted people in her community mm -hmm. and wasn't afraid to uh, seek to help those in need. Mm -hmm. So Tim, moving forward, uh, again, you shared with me when you turned 17 and graduated from high school, mm -hmm. you ended up joining the armed services mm -hmm. and share with us a little bit about what, what led you to that decision, what that was like in there in that service. So what led me to that, to that decision, um, at that time, uh, I still, moving from East Baltimore to West Baltimore, I was, uh, that was that was a a cripple I, I want to say crippling moment in my life as I understood it as as much as as somebody that age could you know it I think about it now and um I'm just like as a as a child you know I, I, I didn't understand what struggles my mom was going through and so uh, I was just obstinate you know it, was, it created a gulf between me and my mom and, and my mom, even though she was saved, because that's one thing I've noticed um, in my experience with Christ is when we accept Christ, we're still who we are. It's just that God is like uh, bumper guards to our personality. He keeps it in check. He's refining us. Too, and, yeah. Yes. And so I'm saying that. So my mom was this hardcore person. And so she giving you an example. And I'm getting to, to what led me to uh going to the military, my mom would be in an open air drug market with uh, big time uh, gangsters and killers. And she'd have a phone and we didn't have wireless phones at that time. She'd have a long extension, uh, the, the phone cord and she'd be, I'm call. I called the cops on this one and she'd stand out there and wait for the cops to come. And when they would come, she would say, that's right. I called the cops. I'm the one that did it. And she had a speaker in her window where she's playing Christian music and in the middle of all of this and people that drug dealers would come by and they would say, uh, all right, we got to stop. Walk past the window. It became a her stoop became a safe place. <laughs> well, that's beautiful. <laughs> and so beautiful. in the midst of all that, uh, my mom, I think, looking at it from her perspective, she she was like this. this there's a gulf between us. And she basically said. You know, you have to graduate. And um, I made the decision based on I wanted to be on the east side. I said, I don't want to ever be in a position where she's telling me what to do again. And so this is showing you the logic of a child. I said, I, I want to be in a situation where no one's telling me what to do. So what I did was join the military. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Now they're going to tell you what to do every exactly. day. Exactly. Every moment. And so looking at it now, I could say it's not that I didn't want anybody telling me what to do. I just didn't want my mom telling me what mm -hmm. to do. And if I could do it all over again, I, would have, I wish I would have listened more to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think most of us feel the same way yeah. uh, towards our parents. So you end up joining the military. Mm -hmm. uh, when you were coming out of the military, you shared with me, you felt like you developed this us and them uh, kind of attitude. What, what led to that? What, what was that about? So what led to that was there was an experience when I was in the military and um, I was in the, in the cafeteria and just summarizing it real quick. And, uh, on the sh on the ship, you know, that's where it was called the mess decks where we would eat. It was one TV. And what people would do is uh, if it was something on TV they wanted to see, they would complete all their work and get there and get to the mess decks and, you know, watch the TV. And then, you know, it would, after the show went off, the next person would get their turn. And so there was a show that I wanted to, to that I, that me and all of my, my friends, we wanted to see, and we followed what everybody did or what the normal practice was. And uh, when that show came on, you know, we had worked hard to and early to get it done. And so we're there and, and someone of a high rank came and said, you guys have to go. And we were all black. And so, when he's when he said that, of course we challenged it, and basically nothing was done about it. And so that was the first time in my life that I had ever experienced uh, someone had a problem with me because of my, the color of my skin, mm -hmm. and and it changed me, and it made me 
see the world differently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is where you saw this us and them yes. kind of yeah. uh, 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 mentality and developing that. Yeah, and, and from that moment on the ship, um, the the ship was divided because the situation it, it really it really got big and it and 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 at the time that ship had a had a history of um of us us and them it was a lot of things that had happened the fbi had had come to the ship before i got there because there was um all kinds of tension on, on that ship. Mm -hmm. Mainly over white, black. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, it, it's really unfortunate. It's sad to see that, but that's what humanity is apart from God. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. So you come out of the military, right? Mm -hmm. And then you shared with me, you ended up uh, becoming part of a, a religion. And what was that about? So when I came out of the military, this was uh, 1989. I didn't have I, I didn't have any I wasn't practicing any religion, but I that part my my personality or my view of the world had formed to the point where, you know, what happened to me in the military I brought out with me. And and that's how I viewed the world. And so, so can I can I stop you there? Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. you say what you brought out with you, were you angry? I was I was angry and I I approach things like um, there's white there's white people and there's black people mm -hmm. and that um, that black people are um, or minorities are we don't we're uh, second class citizens I, I had that mindset mm -hmm. and and I and, and, so, and rightfully so at the time that at the time based on my experience yeah, at the sure. time. And so uh, the way I view the, the, the world w was that, you know, I have to do, because of that situation, I have to do everything, everything extra, extra. I can't, I can't ever be less. I got to do it twice as, twice as good. So this experience was really forming you and mm -hmm. shaping you and... Mm -hmm again, like you mentioned, forming your worldview. Mm -hmm. So you end up becoming part of that, this religion, and what was that about? What was it so, like? So what that religion was about was, um, if I could summarize it, it would be uplifting black people and teaching black people about their history that they haven't known and um, uh, navigating the world separate from, every, from everyone else. And later, you know, I learned that that the separation uh, and this was like I, I came in. You asked me if I was angry. I guess I, I was I was a, a lot angry. And but even and, 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 and Tim, you know, again, this is in a, in a sense, it, it, it's rightfully so. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, just what you saw in the military, the way you were treated in the military. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden it was an eye opening for you. And again, you talked about your culture shifts from the east side mm -hmm. to the west side. Now your eyes are being opened mm -hmm. and it's impacting you. Mm -hmm. you know? Definitely. And so um, so basically summarizing that religion's viewpoint was that um, we are. And when I say we, I mean, at that time, they were uplifting the black man, the black man so that he could participate in society as an equal, because in, in that view of that religion, that black people were, were operating uh, short because everyone else knew who they were and we didn't. And so what they were doing is uh, they were re-educating them, re-educating black people and uh, uplifting them because, and what was interesting, I hadn't prepared for what they were gonna, um, what the next thing that I had to do and um, they, uh, it, no more drinking, no more premarital sex. You know, for that year and a half, I was uh, I was celibate. I ate once once a day. I had a, a discipline structure, and uh, I remember uh, when I got to the point when I was becoming a full fledged member. You know, it was certain things you had to do, and I actually thought that they were gonna say no because uh, I had a son at that time. I, I was nineteen, and uh, my my first child. He was by a white woman, and I thought that oh, they, I thought they were going to say, "Oh, you're kicked out. You can't do it." And that wasn't the case. the The first thing they asked me was, "Are you taking care of your son? Are you, um, are you uh, uh, being a dad? Are you 
t do you have any issues? Because we we're about cleaning you up. And and I told him my son was by a white person, and they said, well, your son isn't considered white. Your son is considered black. And so um, I, that that shocked me. And mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. so that was that. Um, so there was a lot of positive things mm -hmm. uh, that you, you just shared, you know, certain disciplines, uh, mm -hmm. very good, positive things. If you were to, you know, say, what was the picture of God? Because every religion communicates a picture of God, mm -hmm. right? And how we see God impacts not only ourselves, mm -hmm. but it impacts how we treat other people. Mm -hmm. So what would, how would you sum up that picture of God that, you, you were, that was communicated to you? So... The picture of God that I saw doing at that time was that God is vengeful, and that um, for the for the things that w that that happened to his his people, God would uh, separate his people and and literally burn every everyone else. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, that's quite the picture of, of yeah. God. Mm -hmm. So, so if we were to say it was more of an authoritarian picture, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And like you mentioned, uh, a vengeful side thrown on there. But how did that impact your life? I mean, what was that like for you as you're as you're worshiping this God and you're 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 living your daily life? You have you have a child now. You're mm -hmm. raising your child. I mean, how was that impacting? So, you? so what happened was, um, and so specifically, I, sorry about how you were treating other people. Right. You know? So. And so that, so getting into that, so, so now my son is in Rhode Island and me and the mom, I would have him for the summer. I would have him for the whole summer and I would take care of him and buy all, buy, buy what he needed for school when he went back and then she would have him. And then when the summer came, he would, he would go back and forth. And so now, you know, at this time, you know, when I, when I came home, I had friends that I that I knew, you know, of course, from the east side, we still were friends, and so now everything changed because I uh, moved out of my mom's house and I moved into a house that that sold. Um, this religion had a uh, a lead figure, and then he would put out uh, he would sermons, and he was all over the news all the time. So now I'm I'm not at home, and I, I'm. I still hang with my friends, but now I don't eat pork, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't do any of those things. I got to be home at this time. And the way I treated people, you know, and this is the thing about that situation, they uh, taught that there was us and them, but you don't disrespect. Like we were the, the us, but you don't disrespect the them you don't treat them any kind of way you were you were, so it was in their in their in their way they were serving them by but we had the the right religion you know mm -hmm. but you don't disrespect them you don't treat them mean or anything like that mm -hmm. so tim fast forwarding you mm -hmm. end up marrying somebody from your childhood can you share with us a little about what that was like yes so so my first wife i knew since i was a since since we were children and uh, as we grew up, we went our separate ways. She got married. Uh, she was married for twelve or thirteen years. Uh, the marriage didn't work out, at where he ended up uh, getting locked up. And uh, she had three children, and I now have two. And when and so now he's released, and uh, we make a decision that. Um, that I should step back to give to give their marriage a chance to to work, and so as time went on, uh, she, my first wife, decided that she that that they should get a divorce, and so they went through the process of divorcing, and it wasn't a uh, it wasn't a uh, easy process because he didn't want to accept it, and and I actually uh, I knew. We were we knew each other before uh, the marriage, so it was a sticky situation, and so um, um, it it ended up working out, but it was a lot that that uh, that happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you end up getting married. She has three children. You have two children, mm -hmm. and then there was an experience that happened that uh, really impacted your life uh, for Christ. What was that? So. 
um, during the pro during the process, um, it was rough. It was it was a whole it was a, a lot of uh, struggle between he and I, and but he eventually got to the point where where he accepted it because I had stepped back, and so now he. It, it, it was just struggle and, and then he would have times where he would not accept it and so uh, we fast forwarding we we uh, we end up uh, getting close to the point where where we get to the point where we're engaged and so um, she is going to church and at this time you know while I had decided to to leave uh, the religion that, that I was in, I, I thought of, um, I always had in my mind at that point that I, I would relearn, I would return to that, that type of religion, but just with a different group. And so, um, so now, uh, we're engaged and, um, she goes to church. She goes to a, a Christian church and, um, me and her, her uh, understanding of who Jesus Christ was were completely different. And so I would go to church with her and I would sit and listen. But um, again, my understanding was different. And so uh, there was this one day there was a, an altar call and uh, her husband, you know, we had gotten to the point where we or everybody involved could could coexist he sang on the choir, and so I'm in the back of the pew, and the and the pastor had an altar call, and he said, uh, uh, you know, the doors of the church are open, and in my mind, I, I said to myself, I said, uh, with my eyes closed, I said, Jesus, uh, if you're real, if you give me a sign, and I was saying it in a mocking sense, like, there's no way I'm going up there with these foolish Christian beliefs. And so I said, uh, if you give me a sign, I'll go up there and get in the water, almost like laughing in my mind. And so when my eyes opened, her husband, her husband was standing in front of me. And when my eyes opened, I was like, I knew these Christians were like this. We're going to fight in the church. And so it wasn't that. He, he said to me, if you walk up, I'll go and get in the water with you. And so when I became a Christian, it was him that he walked mm. up with me got in the water and he was holding my hand. And from that moment, me and his relationship changed and me and my first wife, we got married and, and our marriage was, was like this. Uh, with his children, when it came time to discipline them, the children, I would call him and say, hey, this is what's going on with your son. This is what this is what he, what they what he did in school. And he would say to me, well, that's your household. You run it. And he would come and he would uh, sit down and he would talk with his children. And and it was a it was it was a relationship that you just don't hear when it comes to to exes and spouses. And then he had a lot of things going in his life and he passed. And um, and I'm, I'm thankful that we all got to coexist in that way. But it was at that moment that. Uh, that was my moment when I when I realized it was something it's something different about Christianity. I like to say that you know um, the previous religion that I was in, some of it was about confrontation, you know, uh, but God confronted me, mm. and when He confronted me, it was uh, with that situation, it was undeniable. So God was using your. Uh who became your wife, mm -hmm. her her ex, mm -hmm. to lead you to to make an impact on you for Christ? Yeah. To actually lead you to make a final decision for Christ? Yep. Uh, that's like almost unheard of, right? The 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 hatred yeah. that usually ends up there, and mm -hmm. he comes and he demonstrates uh, really the heart of God. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Uh, and I always think like story. he actually got in the water with he, you. We were standing. It was me, were him, baptized. me, him, and me, him, and the pastor. And what, what was that impact? Uh, I gotta, I gotta back up. What was the impact that you thought about this guy? Uh, you thought he was standing up to perhaps fight you mm -hmm. in the church. He invites you to go down the aisle, and you went mm -hmm. because you were praying in your mind mm -hmm. that if God shows you the sign, and so here's the sign. I mean, what, 
what was going through your mind as, as in that change, right? Because it went from thinking the guy's standing up to fight you to <laughs> walking you down the aisle. And not only that, he gets in the water with you and you end up being bubbed. So for him, what I saw in him, I knew of him. I, I mean, we had kind of had a relationship before, but it was just from afar. But he was not the type of person that um, that would... Uh, he was a, a, a tough guy, and he didn't do a lot of yielding. And so I was more curious, like, this is, this is uh, God is doing this to this person. And then I started thinking about that church. It's a close-knit church. They had been a part of that church uh, for years. And what it took for him as a man, and, like, her children saw their father walk down. Like, I had my eyes closed. They saw him walk down. And, um, you know, walk up to me. And in his mind, I think that he, he was, because he had a unique relationship with God as well. He was a super talented singer. But um, he had a unique relationship with God. And I think he got to the point where it was at that moment that he accepted that me and my wife are divorcing. And what was in his mind, I, I'm assuming, was that. If she's going to be with someone, it has to be a Christian. And I believe that he was walking down there for God because he assessed his situation and said, this is the best situation for my family. And that is to lean on Christ and make sure this person is accepting of Christ. Mm -hmm. So, but also to add to that, I mean, what type of impact was on your mind that this was the guy that was demonstrating compassion towards you mm -hmm. and love towards you? And uh, he was almost pitying you mm -hmm. in the sense of, you know, I want to bring Tim along mm -hmm. and I'm willing to get in the water with him. And it's funny because, um, it's not funny, but uh, two days earlier, me and him had had a conversation and he was uh, he was very familiar with life in the street and he he said uh, a mutual friend of ours he he had considered having this person visit me and um but he changed he said in his mind he changed it because he knew he knew me and he knew my mother he it was like um he didn't want to go down that route yeah he made a choice to follow yeah. the lord you know yeah and so what it, what it did what it did for me was it showed me that um, that it's a different kind of strength, and the strength that I saw that the the understanding in my theology was it was strength through isolation, and what this showed me was this 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 Jesus this this God or Jesus or however you want to say was strength through relationship. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, mm -hmm. beautiful, and, and I liked what you said that even as time went on, you, you know, if you were having challenges with the children, you would talk to him, mm -hmm. and he would like give you permission to mm -hmm. handle things, yeah. right? Because yeah. they were they were really his children, and you were the stepdad in the picture, mm -hmm. and the fact that you had this relationship where you were working for the good of the children mm -hmm. speaks volumes of what the power and the grace of God can do in human beings' lives yeah. to take away the strife and perhaps hatred and just put love and compassion uh, for each other. Mm -hmm. So, Tim, time again, we move forward in time, right? You mm -hmm. end up moving to Florida. Mm -hmm. um, that's where we met. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you were uh, practicing Christianity, you and your family, mm -hmm. and and you. Uh, we end up meeting and we went through a... Um, a class together, right? Mm -hmm. A Bible class together where we looked at the character of God mm -hmm. and we went from Genesis all the way to Revelation. It was called an Arise curriculum. Mm -hmm. And um, how did that impact your life? I mean, we were on that journey together for almost <laughs> two years, meeting yeah. once a week, yeah. you know? So Arise, uh, it, it, changed, it changed my life in, in a number of ways. The first was that it showed me it showed me God in a way that I had never imagined or never seen. And because of that, it changed in my everyday life. It changed how I interacted with my children and with everyone. And like firstly with, with my children, before arise, I was the type of parent that would say, uh, because I said so, I was a disciplinarian. And um I focus more on 
providing structure to my family and um, protection than relationship. And so when I got to, when I came into contact with Arise, it was like um, God showed me what I was with, without him in mm-hmm. a sense. And mm-hmm. by without him, I mean without the relationship because um, up until that point, my understanding was, or, or my relationship with God was, um, it's a, a knowledge type type thing. And, and so um, one of the things I realized that well, you can have all the knowledge in the world, but if it's not relatable to your everyday life, then you're kind of foolish. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so um, when, with, with Arise, I went from from uh, being the disciplinarian to actually loving my children, and when and they recognized the change, be, and you know it got to a point where they were like, we don't even know who this person is mm. because I was dealing with them um, with an increased patience and um, actually being concerned about you know what they thought. Mm -hmm. So it was as you saw more of the beauty of who God was that was changing your heart, Mm -hmm. and then that was impacting the way you were uh, treating your children and and other people. Again, you know, the way we see God is the way we see ourselves, and it's Mm -hmm. the way we see others, right? So Mm -hmm. it's so huge, this concept of really seeing God for who He really is, Mm -hmm. that He is. 1 John 4, 8 says that God is love. And unpacking that mm-hmm. and seeing what love is, that's what we went through in that Arise curriculum, was really unpacking what love was, not from a world standpoint of view, right, mm-hmm. which changes and, you know, I love you because you love me and, you know, and all the yeah. love songs, you know, I'm yeah. in love with you, but I'm not in love with you anymore. And you know what I'm saying? I'm in love with somebody else. That, that mm-hmm. fickle kind of love but that changes. But God's love is steadfast. He doesn't change. He's consistent. He's like the hound dog of heaven. He pursues after us, doesn't quit. That was what we were unpacking. I just want to back up for a moment about uh, you said that you saw a different picture of God when they hadn't seen before. And again, 1 John 4, 8 says that God is love. What type of picture was that? What kind of attributes were you seeing uh, in God as we journeyed through that time together? So what what I saw was that I saw the patience of God. And so... The previous religion that I read, I would read for um, for reference, for knowledge. You know, you read the Bible, the whole Bible, just to because you're preparing to deal with someone and you want to be familiar with them on on the grounds of what they believe in or understand. So now, uh, in Arise, I'm I'm reading it from my own viewpoint and without uh, a preconstructed preconscribed notion I'm I'm re- I'm reading it from my heart and so now I understand that that God is suffering as well and I had never that concept had never entered my mind and the specific thing that um that I mean when I say God is suffering is it arise awaken many questions but the the biggest one was why does God let all of these things happen. And why does God just allow the everyday stuff to go on? And so what I saw was, is that God is showing us his character and he wants us to make a decision based on what we see. And how that affected me was, instead of trying to forcibly uh, control my children's life, if I, if I take that take that journey with them and let them uh, make the best choice that they could, the same discipline or the same result that I could, that, that I thought that I could get with discipline, I got it. You can get the same result through relationship. Mm. Wow. And at this point in your life, your kids were uh, either in middle school yeah, yeah. on up through high school and beyond, correct? Yeah. yeah. Um, Again, back to, you know, Jesus said, he, I only do what I see the Father doing in John five nineteen. It was this, he had this beautiful uh, picture that he understood of mm-hmm. what God was like. And that was the picture that he sought to communicate to everyone around him. Mm-hmm. 
And that's really what, as I listened to you, what was happening in your life. As you begin to see this um, deeper picture of God, right? Because he's working on your life, but now you're seeing him in a deeper way. And now it's impacting not only for yourself, mm -hmm. but it's how you relate to other people and especially your children. Mm -hmm. And so you had mentioned earlier that your children didn't even really recognize who you were. Now, yeah. what was that like? What were they saying? What were the... Well, they were, uh, what they would say, so, so my children, they had a nickname for me. They, the older ones had a nickname for me. They, uh, they would call me Shrek <laughs> because I was like an ogre. You know, we, it was good times. You know, I don't want everybody to think I'm abusing the ogre. Yeah, yeah, sure. It was but just, it was just. Uh, disciplinary. Uh, yeah, disciplinary. You know, we, yeah. we had, it was, Which is not all bad, right? right. So you just learned to, uh, to balance it out, right? Yeah, exactly. And so what, what they saw, and this is um, as, as they, uh, like, um, like the high school age kids, what they saw was um, now I'm, I'm having conversations with them. Like if I, if I say, um, you, you, you can't, I don't think you should do this. And I'll say, this is why I don't think you should do this because this is, this is where this, this leads. And um, if you do this, I'm, I'm, I'm explaining it to them. And sometimes they would agree. And then sometimes they wouldn't. But the thing that's, that I found that was really interesting when when I when I when when Christ changed my heart, I started. It was like I was experiencing my children completely different, mm. and so now I'm actually looking at them, and they. I found out from talking to them that through all of that discipline, the only the, the biggest thing that they wanted was. They wanted to have a relationship with me. Oh, that's beautiful. You know, there's a little saying, Tim, that says, rules without a relationship equals rebellion. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to repeat that. Rules without a relationship mm -hmm. equals rebellion, right? Mm -hmm. So it sounds to me like you had a rule-based yeah, uh, disciplinary time. action towards your children all the time. Big and time. now you are learning to, to introduce the relationship because of what you saw in God. Mm -hmm. Because ultimately, God's a relational being. Mm -hmm. And that's the storyline of the Bible, is God desires a relationship with each and every one of us. Exactly. And that's through Christ, we are brought into that relationship. It's the whole story. It's the whole story, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the beauty of it. He even here in this world, and that was what was happening to you. Mm -hmm. And now you're you're sharing that with your children. What was mm -hmm. that like for you to to shift from being this authoritarian now to entering into this relationship with your children? I mean, that must have been mm -hmm. uh, 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 just like something you never even imagined possible. So, you know? so you got to you got to see it personally, Pastor Bob, because now I'm thinking about. When we were when we were in a rise, and when you would uh, have the you be leading the, the class out, and I, re, I re, it's coming back to me now where most of the things that I talked about would be conversations that I had with my children, and so um, it's so it's interesting too. Something else that happened while we and I just realized that while we were going through the arise program, is that um, that my uh, view on God had changed and so did did my theology because you know now it's a new theology coming into their lives and they were more accepting of it because they liked this version that they were that they were seeing wow. you know not saying wow. that they they sure. uh, you know agreed a hundred percent the thing that mattered though um, was that that they, are able to talk to me now and they always wow. wanted to but I wasn't able to see it hmm. and so now it's is uh I'm I'm in a rise and, and I'm actually going home and it was you and I know you remember it's like uh I was just on fire and it was uh, it was a good experience yeah well praise God I think of Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18 mm -hmm. it says come God says come let us reason together mm -hmm. you know God invites us to interact with him relationally and that's what you were seeing in this picture of God. And then you're translating that into your family, which is absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. And they're seeing it in you. And now they're, it's opening them up to want to learn more about God, mm -hmm. right? Yep. <laughs> so, um, again, how we see God is it's how we see ourselves. And it's how we're going to treat other people. Tim, fast forwarding a little bit, it didn't work out with your first wife. Mm -hmm. You go through a divorce. Mm -hmm. um, after that divorce, it was about a year out. Uh, you were settling things with your children. Mm -hmm. You had 
brought two children into the marriage. She had brought three children into marriage, and then you had two children together, right? Mm-hmm. Correct. Mm-hmm. And what were the names of the two children you had together? So the 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 two children were TJ and Caleb. Okay. And so um, we, like you said, we had divorced. It was a year out, and um, the divorce. Let me stop you there. How old was TJ and Caleb at this time? During, at, at that divorce time. At the time of the divorce, um, TJ was was in about to go to high school and so they were middle they were in middle middle between middle school okay. and high school and after the divorce a year out uh, we the divorce actually um, went smoothly and um, so uh, my first wife ended up staying in in Baltimore and and I had at first I had a uh, TJ and Caleb with me because the rest of the children are grown and they went their you know separate ways mm-hmm. and so um, it's it's me and TJ and Caleb and um, they are in high school and so uh, this is and this is as the divorce is settling so later later Caleb decides that he wants to to go with his mom and, and so. You know, we made that decision. He went to stay with with his mom, and so me and TJ, you know, we moved from the apartment complex that that we're at, and we move into a, uh, another place. And so it, now it's just just me and TJ. And so this is during that year of um, of the divorce. So it's just me and TJ, and so. Um, and things were looking up for you financially. Think, yeah, the, you yeah. got a better job. And exactly. Things were working out. So share with us a little bit about TJ. What was he like? I, I, I can share with you on my end too. But <laughs> that'd sorry, be, but go that'd ahead. Be fun. I, I'll go first. So yeah. TJ was the type of kid that mm-hmm. when he walked into the room, he lit it up. Mm-hmm. Right. Everybody yep. loved TJ. Yep. Everybody loved TJ. I mean, he just had a personality and a half. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, you know. Uh, I, I didn't know anybody that didn't like like TJ. He was just kind, compassionate, mm-hmm. uh, sensitive. So, so tell us a little bit about TJ. So TJ was the the kind of the kind of child that would uh, he noticed everything, and um, he was neutral in in every situation. Like when if there was an argument between the the children, TJ was Switzerland. And I'm borrowing that statement from Caleb. If uh, it didn't matter who it was, TJ got was always the bridge between everyone. Mm. And so, so he was a peacemaker. Or, yes, yeah. he definitely wow. he definitely Beautiful. was. And so um, so after you know Caleb decided to go to um, and it was hard breaking those two up because TJ and Caleb were attached to the hip. They they had their own language and. Um, the reason f- that Caleb wanted to uh, to go to spend time with his mom is because Caleb was just you know with with children you know they you 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 have a whole you have different children you love them all the same but it's just some that you're more easily you you more easily relate to mm-hmm. and so Caleb wanted to go to to live in Baltimore as well as as far. To, to be with his mom, and so I made the decision that um, you know I don't I don't want him here if he's uh, if he's struggling because it's hard enough for a teenager, and if it's a situation that he's more comfortable in, and you know with then that's fine. And so getting back to uh, with the, the way TJ was, even during the divorce, it was never a thing where it was I like this one more. He treated everybody the same, and so. Um, so now it's me and TJ, and my job had changed where I was on the road, on the road more. And so here's an example of how TJ was. And so um, I would, it's okay. Take your time. While you're composing yourself, I'm going to share with you my version of TJ. Um, the type of. Uh, child or person when he walked into a room he kind of lit it up mm-hmm. uh warm friendly like you said he was sensitive he, he the, the kids all loved him yep that, that, my kids loved him everybody knew tj right that's definitely him and so um, like i was trying to say my job required me to be on the road a lot 
And so I would come home and I had this habit of uh, I would lay sideways across my bed. You know, like the bed would go this way and I would lay sideways. I don't know why I did that. But I would I would uh, just I would say in my mind, I'm gonna lay down for a little while and then I'll get up and shower. Of course, it, it would end up longer and I would wake up and I'd have a blanket over me and my shoes would be off. And because uh, TJ would come by and he'd see me laying, and he'd see me laying there and he just put a blanket on me. Mm. And he and uh, he just was was very, very loving. And, and we and we had a, a closeness because it was it was just us. And at that time, you know, what the thing that I worried that I that I most worried about with all of the, the children is, you know, divorce is hard on families. And, and it was a you know, at that mo at that time, it was like coming out of that divorce, you know, part of the the, the whole thing about that about that year, as I call it. And, I, and the reason why I say year is because I gave myself a year before I started um, before I dated anyone else before um I, I it had i wanted i wanted it to settle is this really going to happen is, is is my life is going to move on and so for that year i just focused on my job and and just um being a dad the best way i could and mm -hmm. supporting the kids mm -hmm. and i had gotten to a point where okay this is working i got a better job um tj is situated you know he's uh He's going to Daytona in the day, Daytona State during the day, and he's working at night. And so he has his own vehicle. Everything is uh, got, has a nice girlfriend. Everything's going good, and 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 it got to a point where I felt like I was coasting. Mm -hmm. So I remember you were sharing with me. Uh, you know, there was one morning. Uh, I believe you were all sharing like a group. Um, um, maybe a video chat where you would share about how things were going for you that day and TJ shared something yeah. <laughs> uh, that morning to give everybody uh, yeah, a so word from TJ. What did he share that morning? I don't, I don't, uh, I don't specifically at this moment remember what he shared, but we had, it was called the check-in and, and her and, and my first wife's oldest son, uh, because all everybody was separated, we had to, we had this. Uh, he came up with the idea that we just check in on each other, and, and we and we'd say to each other, to the group, this is these are what my goals are. This is what my plans are. This is what I've done today to reach those goals. And it was and it was a, a group where we would uh, come together and we'd uh, check in with with each other to to see how we're doing. And um, and it got to a point where um, where where everybody's lives had gotten too busy. And TJ, in one of the videos, he said, "You guys are getting kind of slack on the on the on the check ins." And so um, that's that's what I remember. Okay, now I remember some of the specifics for mm -hmm. maybe to help you, but help. I believe that TJ said when he was saying good morning that day and checking in that he had the day off. And yes. that he had uh, yes. was going to enjoy the day, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Something along those lines. Wasn't that what he was saying? Yes. So, TJ was was working at a local uh, res local restaurant, and um, TJ, like I said, he was going to school, uh, going to Daytona, and he was he was working at the restaurant, and um, spring break was approaching, and. Uh, and this day's check-in, because it was a daily check-in, on this day's check-in, TJ's, he said, my goal is to relax because it's spring mm. break. That's what And was, he so. said that uh, I worked a lot of overtime. He had like 60 hours. And he said, this is the biggest check that I'm, and this was his first first job. And, he's, and he was proud that this was going to be my biggest check. I actually have overtime on it because when you're that age, you know, you don't get a lot of hours. And, and the restaurant that he worked in, they were they would give TJ, try to give TJ excess hours, but legally they couldn't. And TJ was frustrated that he wasn't getting enough hours. And so he finally had got it. He was waiting for the biggest check in his in his life and it had overtime and he's and his and he said, today my goal is to relax because um, it was spring break and um, he had been, uh, his, his schedule was, uh, he would go to school from, I think from eight 
to like maybe one or two. He come home and, and in one of the videos he uh he showed us what he was eating. He had, he now it's coming back to my memory. He he showed us what he was eating. He would prep his meals. He'd have um these healthy uh uh dishes that he put in in plastic and he uh in the video he had ordered some books because me and him and and the young lady he was seeing at the time we would talk about the bible and i would and i would explain a rise to him and tj was 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 like me just super curious and so tj had ordered all of these books he had ordered uh he had ordered a quran he had ordered a bible he had ordered the uh, speech writers, uh, the, the most influential, the most influential uh, speakers of the 20th century. It was a book of quotes from these guys, and TJ was reading these wow. books, wow. and so he's because he wanted his own answers for everything. And this was before spring break. Yeah, that sounds like TJ. Mm -hmm. So then uh, COVID was hitting, right? Mm -hmm. COVID was hitting, and um, things had changed. Life had changed for pretty much everybody, right? Yeah. And um, so then there was a knock at your door one evening. Uh, share with us about that. <laughs> it's okay. Uh. It's all right, Tim. It's all right. You're with friends. So that... So... So... <laughs> so so <clears throat> so that day was uh thursday at 10 o 10 10 at night i had uh was this excuse me was this the same morning that he left the video about his spring break and telling no, him, okay it was no. a different morning so it was 10 10 at night it was thursday and at this time, TJ had a girlfriend, and T they were very close. And um, TJ would sometimes stay over her house, you know, when he when he got from the job, because he'd go over there and unwind. He'd come home late, and I had this thing. I would I would always say, uh, "Let me know where you are," and um, I would text him and and the few <laughs> arguments we never had arguments, but I would just say. Don't have me at asking where you are, and so um, and TJ uh, he was a he, he he was a fast driver too, and he would he get he would get tickets. So this night, uh, I fell asleep, and I woke up at ten o'clock, and the knock at the door it was a police officer, and coming out of my sleep. I was thinking TJ had gotten a ticket or something. Was, but what he said to me, he said, uh, he asked me for my license. And so I went and got my license. And uh, he said, so you're TJ's, Timothy, he said, Timothy Hawkins Jr.'s father. And I said, yes. And, and now I'm starting to worry. And he told me that my son was passed. And and when and when he said that, it, it was like uh, everything started spinning and. I asked him, I said, uh, I said, what happened? And he said to me that he killed himself, suicide. And, and when he said that, um, From what I can remember, I, I dropped to my knees and I couldn't get up. And 
And uh, at that moment, it was like uh, I was trying to uh, accept what this what this man was saying. At the same time, I I was trying I was I wanted to get to my son. And it was like I would try to get up and I was trying to split my body or something, trying to go this way and go that way. And um, then it was like uh, I felt like I was the only person in the world. And everything just was dark. And I, I don't even remember what the what the officer looked like. I just, I remember trying to stand up and I couldn't stand up. And I remember him saying, I'm not leaving until you call someone. And so I called you and uh, now I'm thinking uh, when that officer said that, I started thinking about my family and they're all they're all abroad and so now I have to call I have to call them and I have to, and I have to tell them that TJ is gone mm -hmm. and um so I call my now I'm starting to think about everybody and how they're going to deal with this. And so I had to call my best friend because I knew that my first wife wasn't uh, stable at that point. And so he had to go and tell her and I had to listen to her break down and Caleb was with her and they had been they all had been trying to reach TJ the entire day I called my brother and I had to call my co-worker and when I called my co-worker he lived in Lake Mary and and uh he, he came that night and um, as things started to settle for me, um, as going forward, I found out that TJ had passed at two o'clock in the afternoon and the officer, they didn't get to my house until 10 o'clock and that, and that my son had been gone for eight hours. And so that sent me into, it, it, at, that, at that moment, I felt like I failed. And I thought of all the things that I didn't do. And I felt like part of me had just died and I wasn't it was a split second I, I, don't, I can't say split second but in my mind I had said I was I was angry I was depressed I didn't want to talk to God because I didn't want to, the thoughts that I was having, I didn't want to say them to him. Tim, uh, uh, first off, we just want to say, I mean, it's obviously the worst nightmare for any parent to go through to lose a child. And I, I can't put myself in your shoes, and I know a lot of people can't, but there's a lot of people that are listening to this podcast today that 
have gone through similar things, you know, and very difficult uh, things. I remember being there that night with you, and um, it, it, we're just lost for words. I think everybody's lost for words, just trying to um, comfort you and, and seek God for comfort. And, you know, God was giving you the grace uh, moment by moment to, to cope and to, to deal with just one of the worst nightmares that could come upon anybody. So you were mentioning how you felt like you couldn't talk to God at that moment, obviously, or not just at that moment during that time. It's just hard to put it all in the perspective. You know, hard to put the pieces together. So as we moved into that night, I, I was... Um, amazed through this process as I journeyed with you, how God had given you the grace to to deal with it all, you know, because uh, you had a lot to deal with, not only in your own heart was not just broken, but shattered. And um, God gave you grace to move forward, you know, and then you had to explain to the children and, you know, they had to process it themselves and, yeah so um with that um i eventually i eventually got to a point where um once everybody knew and the phone i guess uh when when people got there and i started thinking about my family that's when I when I when I started thinking about my family. That's when I I said to God, I can't. I said to myself, and I was directing it towards God that I can't do this, and I don't know how, and I don't know what to do. And as I was thinking about my children and my family, what came to me was just to love them. And what that meant was, um, I can't look at, I can't expect them to handle this the way that I would. It meant that I had to hold them together and prepare them for life without TJ. And so, um, it was during that process that, uh, and when I say process, as I was talking to them, the only thing I had to draw on was now was um, was uh, my relationship with God and, and how I perceived it. And so the way I perceived it was that um, I had a whole bunch of questions, a whole bunch of anger, and I said, um, I have to get my family started in accepting this. And at the same time, I have to find out what happened with my son. And so I, I, in my mind, I have to support my family and keep them together because um, it, as you can imagine, it was just a mess. And, um, and what I learned was that once I was able to, uh, to gather myself, I learned um, that I kept in mind that God suffers with us and that with um with every death that's not a part of God's plan and it's a lot to it's a lot well to. sure well what you know and I went through again going through that journey with you the whole uh you know being with you that night and then the the process of the funeral and seeing all of TJ's friends came in and 
the church was beyond packed with so many young people because he was so loved and uh, so cared for. But through it all, uh, I saw in you uh, that God was sustaining you. Uh, again, I, I don't believe it was just a broken heart. I think it's a shattered heart. So I saw your brokenness. I saw your heart being shattered, but yet still in your eyes, I saw that there was this hope and uh, you hadn't let go of God. Yes, you had that anger. There was a lot to process, um, even with the police department, the investigation and what happened. It was just a lot, but God was still there present with you. And, and you know, it's interesting you mentioned about how what was coming to your mind was that God suffers with us. Because it was never God's intention for us to experience the heartache and pain. When you look at the story of the Bible, it was never God's intention for us to experience the heartache and pain that we do in this world. Mm. But he has promised, you know, strength and grace for us. Mm. And he suffers with us. I mean, that's a huge picture of God, you know, because his goal is to get us out of this world when Jesus comes and creates all things new. Mm. But in the midst of living in this world there's all kinds of horrible tragedies yeah. and sometimes they hit home like this one with you again parents worst nightmare mm -hmm. had uh, come upon you just when things were looking up for you and uh, here you were but God was giving you grace so so Tim share with us how did you get through it I mean you talked about anger you talked about these oh, this this thing how did you get through it what was it that so what it was that got me through it is, so for me, I can't say for everyone, but everything I held dear, I questioned, starting with myself, uh, I questioned my belief, my belief system, uh, I, quest, I, I was questioning the, the police and, and how they dealt with the situation. It's everything around me was just in doubt and and I and so what I said was uh, where is God in this and and it's a fair question hmm. right and, and a lot of people ask that question yeah and so when I said where is God you know as I was saying it I really didn't have a lot of time to uh, at that moment to process everything because the phone was ringing um everybody had questions and so it was sort of a thing of where i actually have to I don't, it wasn't like days or i can't remember the time but I, it was like i have to put god on hold I, th I thought put god on hold for a second and i got to get my family together because no matter what um, I'm still a dad and I have to deal with I, I I felt like I had to deal with each one of my children and their distinctive personalities mm -hmm. angry so angry lashing out broken and I just had to keep us together to get us to the point where we could start to figure this out and doing and it was doing that process when I was being asked questions that I saw God and 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 what I saw was just summing it summing summing it up that God doesn't uh it's, death is not a part of his plan and like I was saying earlier he doesn't force us to do things but in every in every tragedy God is sad and, and, and something that jogged my memory, it was one of my friends that was uh, struggling with his relationship with Christ. And um, he, he, asked, he started asking me about questions. He was asking me, it wasn't at this moment, it was during the process. He, was ask, he asked me, he said, um, so he would ask me this question about Christ. He would ask me this question. And, and I'm and in my mind I'm thinking why is this guy asking me these questions and and he's and he said the reason why I'm asking is because I don't know how you're able to to deal with this like you are and I'm re-looking and rethinking my relationship with 
God. Wow, and, and, that's beautiful. And so he gave me a book, and it was a small book, and it was about a man. And, he, and my friend wrote this long uh, passage in the book, and it was actually this book that, um, this statement from this book that got me through it. And, and what it said was, this man, he had a story similar to mine, and he, and he ended up separating from God. But the man asked, he said, God, where were you when my son died? And in the book, he said he realized that, it's, he said that he heard God's voice saying, I was the same place when, that I was when my son died. Mm -hmm. and, wow. and so when I thought about that, as I started uh, rationalizing, rationalizing that and going through it, it got me, it helped me think that or understand that God has never missed a funeral from anybody that's died. And, and um, we were talking earlier and, um, and I said this, that we're able to go to sleep and you know sometimes I'll, some people have tortured dreams or nightmares but in essence we get a release where god doesn't sleep so he never gets a break from the people dying and from all of the tragedy in life that that goes on and so uh as i now i'm realizing that i'm that just the fact that i'm starting to rationalize the the, these things now I'm able to talk with uh, or deal with my children individually and deal with them in their relationship that they had with uh, with TJ and um, and so it started turning into uh, we're we're coming together the family's coming together and we are now advancing in this tragedy together Tim, you had mentioned when the police officer came to the door uh, that that tragic evening that he mentioned that TJ had taken his own life. Mm -hmm. um, after the funeral was all over, I was with you. We, we went down to the police department and met with a detective, and he shared with us what they perceived as their evidence. And mm -hmm. it, it seemed pretty inconclusive to us. Uh, we left there um, really not sure mm -hmm. if that's really what happened, that TJ had taken his own life. Mm -hmm. um, how do you feel in your heart, and how does your family feel about that? In our hearts, uh, we know, or we are very convinced that TJ did not commit suicide because of the, the way the police handled it and the the way the police handled it, the there was a whole lot of evidence that that wasn't presented, that didn't come until after, and the fact that uh, TJ, some of TJ's belongings were missing, and where he where he was, it was a lot of individuals that that were involved, and there were differing stories, and from people that he that he worked with, it was like the police department was overwhelmed by. Uh, by the case. Mm -hmm. You know, as I listen to the, your story, Tim, again, going back to our journey through the Arise uh, curriculum and looking at the picture of God and how it changed your life and uh, gave you a different perspective uh, and how you saw God in their uh, suffering with us, how you saw God as a relational being. Um, we know it was not God's intention for this to happen to TJ, but it was it was he was preparing you for this moment to uh, in the midst of your tragedy distill uh, that he was using you even with your friend uh, seeing seeing God working in your life through it all asking you questions and then uh, you being able to work with your children uh, individually through the whole process you know it's 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 really a miracle story of God sustaining you in, in the worst hardship that had come to your life. Yeah. You know? So you have to hold on to God, the, the whole story. And um, 
it's, it's like in our lives, if, if someone were to just talk about or focus on one part of, of your life, it's going to be an incomplete story and you're going to be mm. disappointed. That's good. And so with God, when you hold on to the, the whole story and the whole story is from start to finish, yes, life is full of tragedy. It's going to happen. It's going to hurt. It still hurts. But you have to hold on to the end as well. And every story has has two parts, a beginning and an ending. And so usually the most disappointment comes when you stop. And when you stop, that's when everything has a chance to, to settle on you. If you keep going through the journey, and for me, going through, as I was going through that, dealing with everybody and and I, and I want to point out, or, or it just comes into my, my memory, that even the church changed because I saw my church like I had never seen them. And it was, it was so many people from the church that reached out and supported me. And it's not many people that can say that, uh, you know, we all have uh, differences and disagreements in church, but in that moment, I felt like you know, the value of community. Yep. I felt like the entire church was going through this with me. Mm. And um, it was, I saw the church differently. And um, just going through that, holding on to that promise that I'm never going to understand everything that that happened but um later on i would say i have to hold god accountable for this check and what i mean and what i mean by that that's a personal thing that i have is that god said that he would never leave you that he would never forsake you and that all things work out mm, and yes. so that's and and sometimes when people hear that, they, it, it's actually a stone because you just say that. But for me, as I'm experiencing, as I'm experiencing this, I'm I'm hearing and seeing how TJ affected everybody, everybody's life in the short time that that he was here. But I'm also seeing that um, the accountable part that I'm talking about with God is that. I will see him. I will see him again. And that it's going to be uh, more tragedy. And our, our goal, or our, our function in life is to hold on to God. That's why he says, hold on, hold on to me, Amen. because he is aware of the things that we're going to come into contact with. That's beautiful. With. Absolutely beautiful. I love what you shared about the story, right? You look at the story of the Bible. And when you look at the Bible, uh, you get to see what reality is. Mm. We have we have expectations and perceptions of what reality is or what we expect of God that aren't even real, right? Mm. So that's why when bad things happen to us, oftentimes we'll say, well, why is this happening to me? Mm. I'm doing this for God. I'm doing that for God. But when you open the story, mm. you'll see that bad things happen to good people. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And, and in this sin cursed world, bad things happen to good people. Mm -hmm. But God is in the midst of that, just like with you and in your story. God is in the midst of of the, the, the heartache and pain and suffering of humanity, seeking to give us strength to lift us up because there's that end of the story, like you mentioned, mm -hmm. which is the second coming of Christ, where he's promised to make all things new and all those that are hid in Christ will rise again, right? So TJ will rise again. Mm -hmm. Definitely. TJ will rise again. Tim, uh, we thank you so much for sharing this story. I know this is not easy on you, <laughs> but the world, when you look around, there's many people who have are experiencing this pain and aren't sure how to deal with it. And that there's many people who will maybe eventually go through a similar situation. I believe your story is going to give them courage and hope and strength. If you were to just speak to an audience of people who are going through perhaps what you went through and it was fresh, 
and you've been there, what would you say to him? What I would say is take everything step by step. Develop your relationship with God. Get, get yourself to the point where you can step back and look at the whole picture and don't dwell on the calamity because no matter what, you're going to have to move forward. And I would say step back, make a conscious decision of how am I going to proceed? Because at the end of the day, it's not just going to be you. It's going to be everybody that's around you. And they're going to look at and they're going to react to how you respond. And, and the most important thing I would say is love and forgive yourself and do the same with everybody that you come into contact with. Well said, Tim. Thank you so much again for joining us uh, on this podcast and sharing your story. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Uh, again, I, I mentioned that we know it was a difficult road for you, but people are going to be blessed. And, and just thank you for coming in and sharing your heart. Uh, we want to thank you for tuning in today to our Love Shave Life podcast. If you would like to hear more of our podcasts or perhaps read our blogs or check out our other resources, you can go to loveshave.life. That's loveshave.life. If you want to shoot us an email, if you have questions for Tim, uh, you can contact, contact us at hello uh, at loveshape.life. That's hello at loveshape.life. Uh, until uh, next time, uh, lean in to a Love Shape life. Thank you so much for tuning into the Love Shape Life podcast. We hope you find this podcast not only inspirational, but life-changing. Here at Love Shaped Life, we're working to create a community, an online community, in fact, where individuals like you can connect with each other and lean into God's love together. We also provide spiritual wellness coaching where we walk alongside people to help them to see the beauty of God's character, discover if there's anything that might be hindering them from finding the healing power that's in that love. And as you might have expected, Love Shaped Life is crowdfunded individuals like you give generously to make this dream a reality. If you'd like to join that crowd, you can give today at loveshaped.life.